Sadly, the president of the society can't be here this evening, but in many ways, as he is a student of Chinese, and I'm a geologist, and, uh, and geology happens everywhere, so it's probably much more appropriate that I should introduce our, our speaker this evening th th than he should. This evening's lecture is the first of five in, in a series organized by the Center for the Advanced Study of the Arab World in Edinburgh University and hosted by the Society. The other lectures will take place in December, January, February, and March. The purpose of the lectures is to provide the public with a greater perspective and insight into the Arab world, focusing on different aspects of its history, uh, its culture, its religion, and its politics. Uh, Scotland and Edinburgh have a, a long uh, history of links with the Arab and the Islamic world. Uh, for example, I believe that Edinburgh University has been teaching Arabic for 200 years, which is longer than any other institution uh, in Britain, and that's a reflection of the links that it's, that it's had. Our speaker this evening is General Simon Mayle, Assistant Chief of the uh, General Staff at the Ministry of Defence. He's a cavalryman, did actually look for his horse outside, but <laughs> sad to say he came in something much more, much more modern. He was uh, commissioned into the Hazars in 1979 after taking a degree in modern history at Balliol College in Oxford. After having been commissioned, he served in Germany, in Cyprus, in Britain, in Oman, and, and Belgium. He was operations officer for the UK Armoured Division in the first Gulf War and has completed a book on Turkish security policy during uh, that period uh, whilst taking up a defence fellowship at St Anthony's College in Oxford. He was appointed Assistant Chief of the General Staff in, in January 2007. Uh, he has a keen interest in politics and history and the theatre. He's considerable in, uh, experience of the Middle East, and, uh, and my notes tell me that he speaks very passable Arabic. He's written, <laughs> he's written several articles on crusading history, on Turkey, and a jihad philosophy, uh, but all that pales into insignificance beside the fact that he is a long-suffering Tottenham Hotspur supporter. <laughs> so let me now invite General Mayle to give his lecture on jihad and the surge in Iraq. General Mayle. Well, thank you very much, Jeffrey, and uh, good evening to you all. Uh, the job I was doing, uh, hence which gives me a slight, a slight, whatever, competence to speak about Iraq, is I, I was the Deputy Corps Commander uh, in Baghdad from, from late 2006 until early 2007. And I'll come back to that in terms of that was, to an extent, a bit of a tipping point in our assessment of how the Iraq episode, experiment, uh, invasion, uh, prospect, etc., might turn out. And I thought just before I, was, just before I kicked off on matters Middle East, and I've just mentioned, because since I see a lot of people wearing poppies, that at one stage the Royal British Legion wanted to go to um, uh, Finland at the anniversary of the Winter War of 39-40 between the Finns and the Russians. And they wanted to place a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Now, the Finns are very brave soldiers, and they've got lots of memorials, but they were slightly, slightly confused about this sort of rather British concept. So when the, um, when the team from the Royal British Legion turned up with their great wreath, they were led up to a rather big memorial on the outskirts of Helsinki. And um, they went forward in due style with the, with the wreath, and they stood there, and they placed the wreath, and they stood up and bowed and stepped back. You could just see a quizzical look on their face. And as they addressed their Finnish host... They said, um, <clears throat> that, that very moving service, that. They said, I couldn't help noticing on the memorial the name Sibelius. And the chap said, yes. And he said, well, wasn't he a great composer? And they said, yeah, he was a really great composer, but, but as a soldier, completely unknown. <laughs> as I say, if, we'd been talk, if I'd been giving this talk between 2003 and 2006, I think we'd have had a very different atmosphere and background uh, to what was going on. I'll come back in slightly more detail to the 2003 uh, and why the situation after the coalition invasion went so badly wrong. I want to look in this uh, to an extent with a, a little bit of historical background, uh, which is why I talk about jihad, because I think the historical ideological origins of that, both in its very obvious nature, which is a sort of, a, a sort of analogy with a sort of the European concept of crusade, but with its other, its other meaning of uh, the greater jihad, the, the struggle within yourself, it, it is important for understanding in among the chaos of 2003-04 uh, 
um, the philosophy under which the jihadists, sort of ca characterized by Osama bin Laden to excel al Zakawi and al Masri, uh, sought to gain advantage from, from that. And then I want to close in on Iraq, uh, again, just to show you how the confluence of anarchy straight after the invasion, insurgency that grew very quickly, incipient civil war between Sunni Shias, potentially Kurds, Arabs, etc., and a totalitarian ideology largely imported through the lines along the uh, Euphrates and Tigris Valley really did threaten to overwhelm the coalition in its attempt to uh, its great experiment, uh, and certainly the Iraqi people and the level, of, of the level of violence and the casualties, particularly among the civilian community there. And I look at that al-Qaeda for shorthand strategy. And then the strategy characterized by the surge, which is a hallmark, and I want to explain a bit more the surge. It's slightly, it's slightly used as shorthand, and people use it rather, rather loosely, simply to refer to more American troops coming into Iraq. Uh, it, was con it was a considerably more sophisticated strategy uh, that the Americans adopted in 2007 till now, largely driven uh, by Dave Petraeus. Uh, useful just, sorry, let me just, um, I used to say to people uh, who'd come from, from America in many cases, um, and again, for those of you who have American friends, you've got to realize this is quite an alien part of the world among the sophisticated Beltway bandits, they know it well. But for many soldiers coming out of the Midwest or San Francisco or Wisconsin or wherever, uh, this, is a, this is a difficult, a difficult area to understand. And I used to say, if you really need to understand a problem, you better get a bigger map. Um, and it is important to spot this. And I'll come back again to a little when I talk about jihad philosophy and how it is driven and takes its, uh, quite a lot of its impetus from clearly the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and the division of the, the former Ottoman Empire into what are fundamentally Western-driven named states, frontiers, uh, and the like. And so there you have Iraq, largely drawn up by the good Gertrude Bell et al. Uh, clearly, uh, the interesting thing about Iraq here is it straddles a number of fault lines. Within it, clearly it has a Kurdish-Arab fault line. It's clearly got a Sunni-Shia fault line. It sits on the Arab-Persian fault line. To an extent as a Ba'athist regime, it sat on what, could, what one might characterize as a sort of Wahhabist, Salafist, secular Ba'athist um, fault line as well. It's a real hodgepodge, Iraq, as you know, carved out of three of the former, um, uh, the former provinces of the, um, of the Ottoman Empire. And of course, it trails all the way back through here, through Syria, where many of the foreign fighters supporting jihadists came down these two, two river lines, Tigris, where the, uh, the, a lot of the, the, Sunni, uh, the Sunni recidivist uh, movements take place, Sunni, uh, Sunni Triangle. Clearly here, you've got a very difficult border to control down to the Shatala marshes, this wood, uh, hill line, where, of course, a lot of support was coming from Tehran uh, to Muqtad al-Sada and the Shias. A lot of financial support. Saudi Arabia running, running with the fox, hunting with the hounds, as usual. Uh, and then a lot stretching off into the Maghreb um, and down into the Horn of Africa of people inspired by the jihadist uh, ideologies of al zakawi working their way up, come and fight within here in a very messy messy conflict uh, between ethnic groups, religious groups, Western ideology, modernist ideology, etc. This again, just to show um, a in a little more detail, this is largely the, the Kurdish area here, and the fault line is clearly just north of Kirkuk, Sulaymaniyah, a hell of a lot of oil potential in Kirkuk. In fact, the British held on to this for a very long time. It was one of the big, it was one of the big areas around Mosul, Kirkuk, when the British ran Iraq in the 1920s were a cause of enormous friction uh, with, the, with the nascent Turkish Republic. Shia, largely down here, not that old historically, and of course during the Saddam times, many, many connections across to Iran, and a generation of Shia Iraqi politicians who remember the help and succor and refuge they were given during the Saddamist, uh, the, during the Saddamist regime. And then this very strong Sunni area, Tikrit, Saddam's birthplace, out here through Anbar, the tribes in Anbar, come back to those, of course, they were absolutely critical uh, to the change strategy in 2007. And of course, you know, out here, almost absolutely nothing, the Saudi border 
etc., down into Jordan. A few of the key parts of, of Iraq. Um, I'm going to talk about it to an extent from my perspective in Baghdad as the, as the deputy to, um, to the Americans, but actually the interface not just with the coalition or, or with the coalition and the Iraqi army as we were capacity building. So I'm not going to dwell really on the British experience in Basra. I'm more than, more than happy uh, to take that up in questions. It, is a, it was a specific set of issues down in the south. No al-Qaeda influence here, almost no Sunnis, fundamentally a, a power play within Shia groups, Arab Shia groups, and Iranian-supported Shia groups. But I will come back to that because the change of strategy is what has actually pushed to the right the Iranian influence in Iraq. And a lot of that is to do with, do you define yourselves as a Shia first or an Arab, Arab first? This area here, Baghdad, obviously, Fallujah Ramadi, they're almost, again, a byword, a byword for violence and jihadism and Sunni resistance, etc., to the coalition. A real, a real, a real punching match uh, in the areas of Fallujah Ramadi, Haditha, out to his uh, and, as I say, the, the foreign fighter lines coming down through uh, the, the Euphrates. And then if you take it north, this area, which doesn't actually get much, uh, get a great deal of... of Publicity, publicity is the wrong word, probably, probably recognition, very, very high up in the list of priorities for the Shia government. It's called Diyala, around the areas of, of Bakuba, Balad Ruz. A really tough fight goes on there. Most of the media, most of the media interest in, um, in Iraq was centered around Baghdad, the Sunni Triangle, which is fundamentally around the areas of Tikrit, Samara, and Ramadi, Fallujah. But this was, this was a very tough fight, not yet finished. Mm -hmm. Up here will still be an issue, Kirkuk. And then you come across to Mosul. That, interestingly, is really what we might call at the moment the, la the last stronghold of al-Qaeda in Iraq. Still, being largely because of the difficulty of controlling this, this very open border with the Syrians, still where foreign fighters are coming through. This one, to an extent, largely closed off. But this area is where they've consolidated. In terms of jihad, and I'm just going to say that, that I suspect in this audience there will be people who are far, far more qualified to talk about it, but it is worth... Just recall it, it has, the concept of jihad has sat very firmly at the center of Quranic thinking right from, uh, right from the time of Muhammad. But it is, of course, worth noting that uh, Muhammad's contrast between the greater jihad and the lesser jihad, the meaning, to an extent, in, has been sort of confused with the idea of crusade or holy war. In fact, it's, it's, um, it's linguistic origins, moral origins, are largely do with the inner struggle and that was what Muhammad certainly went quoted as saying that he had returned from the lesser jihad, which was the fight against the infidel, to the greater jihad, which was the struggle within itself, within himself. But clearly the militant interpretation of jihad is the one that has captured the, imag the imagination and is the one that has proved such an accelerant among frustrated, alienated youth in the Islamic world. In the 1990s, two seminal works, Fukuyama's End of History, which seemed to give the idea that um, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, frankly, it was uh, liberal democracy, it was uh, market economy, et cetera, et cetera, we're going to win. There was no other real alternative um, to those. And, of course, the rather darker and more pessimistic uh, thesis put forward by Samuel Huntington under Clash of Civilizations. The thesis I wrote when I was at St. Anthony actually was, was, was entitled Jihad, The Clash Within Civilization, because I was rather more interested at how jihad philosophy was used, not in the rather more obvious way to confront the infidel, the uh, Western or the Crusader, whatever, the Jew, um, but how it was used to justify violence within the, within the Islamic world. Um, and Huntingdon rather identified this, this mil millenarian streak uh, within the Islamic world that had happened really, had grown since the fall of the Ottoman Empire, as another, another type of totalitarianism with its concept of an ideological vanguard that actually determined who the enemy was, its, its own self-fulfilling prophecy of, a, um, of satanic forces closing in on it, its own definition of who the enemy was, and an increasing propensity to violence. And I think it's interesting to say that we, if you take it back to the 1600s, 16, 1700s, just to say how the, the, the division of parts of the world took place within Christianity, which had really its, its 
at its root, the idea, dare I say, really paraphrasing, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's, has proved to be a remarkably, enormously clever bit of sophistry, um, because the demands of Caesar do change, but you can continue to give, render unto God what he demands, morally, ethically, uh, and spiritually. And the three developments that took place in the Western world, or the three developments, I, I would argue, that have to take place anywhere, but which do determine how you move forward, is the relationship between religion, religious and secular authorities, the concept of the nation and the state, and the relationship, therefore, within the state and the individual via politics or the law. And it's arguable that the West answered those questions at considerable bloodshed um, in the wars of religion and the civil war, frankly, that took place within Christianity in the 17th century, to our, to our satisfaction. If you look at Islam and you take a universal ummah, you take its origins in a very militant expansion, a very successful initial burst out of the, uh, the desert in the 7th century, and the concept of it not being open, the Quran and the Hadith, etc., not really being open to interpretation, or that interpretation being, being held very closely by, by certain leaders. Then you get a sort of matching of this universal Ummah under the Ottoman Empire. But while the, while the Christian world, the Western world, is splintering largely under the assault of secularism, humanism, rationalism, individualism, suddenly the Ottoman world is actually shattered under the pressures of war in the, first cent in, the, in the First World War. And you end up with a completely new uh, landscape in the Middle East. New names, new frontiers, new concepts. There is nothing really within Islam that has driven that at all. They're all alien. And the, and the, and the concepts of government that are imported by the British, by the French, Italians across the place, are all viewed as alien. They're all viewed as infidel to an extent. And that allied to an idea that you can challenge authority from below in the cause of a god above has led to real stresses and strains, uh, I would argue, within the Middle East, which have not been necessarily satisfactorily resolved to the, um, the satisfaction of, the, of, of, of those people, the people who live in that area. And you get within that frustration, I would argue, alienation, challenges to legitimacy, and within that, the rise again, I would say, of jihad or the attraction of jihad. And you get within that, not simply again, as I say, the very obvious one of Muslim versus Christian, Muslim versus Jew, Muslim versus Hindu, etc. But you get this idea of jihad, of those protectors, of those within the Islamic world who are designated as apostates, heretics, or compromisers. Hence, dare I say, the likes of the Saddamist, Saddamist regime. And this compromise a bit is precisely what the likes of Osama bin Laden, al-Zawahiri, al-Zakawi chose that they would identify who, who had compromised. Now, the interesting thing in there is jihadists, extremists, as I say, I'm using slight shorthand here, then actually arrogate to themselves the decision against who they wish to use violence again, against. And the story of Iraq in 2003 to 2009 was an absolutely lethal uh, explosion of rather indiscriminate bloodshed against anybody who appeared either as an infidel, a Shia, a compromiser, a secularist, a modernist. Now, if I just take you very briefly back to 2003, it was, I'm not going to here to either defend the legality, legitimacy, etc., simply as a soldier, uh, to say what I observed. I was actually at um, King's College London at that stage. But it did look that people had really failed to grasp the difference between the liberation of Kuwait in 1991 uh, and what was going to be attempted uh, under what was fundamentally a sort of neocon agenda. We can have a big discussion about what persuaded the US to lead a coalition against Saddam and build up a case for it. But the Americans went in and there was a lot, a lot of debate in Washington, as you'll know, between Rumsfeld, and it's very interesting you know, in, in hindsight, between Rumsfeld and, um, uh, and Colin Powell. And Rumsfeld took control of the bureaucratic process. Rumsfeld was in the middle of his own battle against the American army, who he viewed as old-fashioned, staid, far too focused on the Cold War, far too heavy. So he, to an extent, in his own mind, as Secretary of State of Defense, was going to use the invasion of Iraq as his testbed for what, he would, what we would describe as the go first, go fast, go home. A lot of very wiser voices within the American military establishment 
argued very strongly that if we were going to invade Iraq for the purposes of overthrowing Saddam, that we needed to understand what we were going to unleash in that, frankly, artificial country. Precisely the splits, as I say, the Arab-Persian border, the Sunni Shia, the secularists against the, uh, uh, and reformists against the traditionalists, the Kurd, Arab, etc. And people like Rich and Seki said, we will need 400,000 soldiers. And he was turned down. And Tommy Franks, who was a, a, at best a, a tactician, not a strategic leader, led the invasion, which in straight military terms was a masterpiece, but in operational strategic terms led both the coalition and the Iraqi people into a whole world of pain. And allied to that, if you're not going to take enough of your own troops, you have got to then use the weapons at your hand, which would be to have co-opted within your broader coalition those elements of Iraqi society who fundamentally might support some of your aims, which would be, of course, the overthrow of Saddam, probably democracy, probably a degree of secularism, probably just straight Iraqi patriots. Uh, and what we did, of course, was de down to the lowest level, including in Mosul alone, 40,000 teachers. And we then chose to disband the Iraqi army. And, we're in, and in disbanding it and choosing to disband and rebuild it, we assumed we, we would have enough time to build up the capacity of a new army in terms of capability before the whirlwind overtook us. And again, you're very, you're very aware, and I'm not going to dwell on it, that between 2003 and certainly 2006 when I arrived, the whole strategy was horribly skewed. Instead of carrying the Iranians, uh, the Iranians, I think very understandably, they now had American troops on their eastern border in Afghanistan and a very large chunk of American troops on their western border uh, in, in, uh, um, in, in Iraq, let alone any, any wider, wider philosophical, religious, etc., cetera, um, tension that was going to engender very much in their interest to take advantage of the coalition weakness and their failure, their failure to have, ex to have capitalized uh, on going in there, uh, not, to, not to try and unsettle them. The British down in Basra b bore quite a lot of the brunt uh, of Iranian influence there. And in the meantime, clearly the Sunni resurgence, uh, the Sunni, um, resurgence uh, started uh, in the Euphrates Valley particularly, uh, but up in the, in the Sunni Triangle. So you really had four, a confluence of four strategies at that stage. You had a general opposition to the US-led coalition, which united, actually, in many ways, not the Kurds, to be honest with you, but largely the Sunnis and the Shias, all sorts of elements of that for all sorts of reasons, many of them very understandable, decided to have a whack at the coalition. You clearly had the Sunnis reacting to the loss of power uh, and their own concern and paranoia that a Shia government would turn, turn, its, turn the whole Saddam construct inside out. It is worth remembering, however, there were a lot of Shias within Saddam's Ba'athist government. You then had Shia paranoia and the counter-reaction, and then on top of that you had this accelerant, uh, which almost led to a civil war, which was, which was the influx of foreign fighters, uh, of whom the most, uh, the most manically, manically impressive uh, in terms of Shia anarchy and violence was, was probably al-Zakawi, followed by a chap called al-Masri, in Arabic, the Egyptian. Uh, and this was very much foreign-based, but the coalition simply did not have the capacity to see that off. And as I say, we had the countervailing strategy, which had been to go in, impose democratic forms, Western government, and get out. Very, very naive. I'll go to Iraq 2006 when I arrived. I think the first slide, just a quick, a quick lay down on this, because the boundaries remain the same at the moment. But we had... A lot, about 37 nations in, in the coalition. British down here in Basra, this large, four, four large provinces, not much, not much out here, frankly, but this, absolutely critical to the future development of Iraq. Oil fields here, very rarely challenged, actually, the oil continued to flow from the first day of the invasion. Out vile some very, very rickety offshore terminals there. They don't refine anything in Iraq, nor do they in Iran. It's unbelievable. They export vast amounts of oil, but have to import petrol. And for a long time, we had to put up enormously with trying to get the flow of petrol into the country when borders were being closed. Up at the north, the South Koreans uh, hit up an extraordinary relationship with the Kurds, a totally safe area. They never had a single casualty or a single security incident since 2003. And it is a slightly bizarre ethnic mix, South Koreans and Kurds. 
this area, which is now actually the, the, the focus of most of the military activity, uh, was under what they call multinational division north, uh, the Americans. You've got to keep thinking here, this was all underpinned by the Iraqi army, but at a very low level of competence. Multinational division Baghdad, we had a whole uh, a division, 20,000, nearly 30,000 American troops there. 160,000 American troops across the place. But a hell of a lot, if you take it from me as a soldier, 160,000 American troops does not translate into many on the ground because the, the support for a modern, very equipment-biased army locks a hell of a lot of people into, into the supply. Um, this area was run by the Poles, um, was normally fairly, fairly benign. This southern area was eventually locked into, into multinational brigade division Baghdad, uh, and this included Kabla and Najaf. In 2004, major, major punch-ups between the coalition and Muqtadr al-Sada and the Jaysh al-Mahdi. Very little going on down here, although funnily enough, this was the Hajj route for, Shia, uh, for Sunni pilgrims, uh, for pilgrims, sorry, headed, headed, headed to Mecca. And this, which really caught the attention, almost nothing in here, but this was a, a real punchy match, as I say, Fallujah, uh, Ramadi. Um, so really, about 98% of most of the attacks in Baghdad, uh, sorry, in, in Iraq, took place really uh, like that. Although this is what caught the press in Great Britain, only 2% of attacks were ever taking place in Basra. But when you see how they capture the, the imagination, you can imagine uh, the level of violence was going on uh, in the Baghdad area. I'll throw this up again, just, just a, a few sort of, if I may, sort of rather ironically say, holiday snaps. This really was, th this is the, uh, was the green zone. Some of you may have read that uh, slamming indictment, again, uh, of, the co of the coalition provisional authority in 2004, um, imperial life in the Emerald City. I mean, it's, I say, if I was standing up, I'd, I'd, I'd find very little good to say about how we had conducted ourselves until, as I say, about 2007. But this is, this is the green zone, international zone, increasingly being handed over to the Iraqis, and quite rightly, but a, a completely and utterly barred off, almost as well defended as it was under Saddam. And believe me, Iraqis were very quick to point that out to me. The big U.S. embassy uh, being built there, the largest U.S. embassy, I think, uh, in, in the world. That is where the hands of victory, again, that very iconic Baghdad, um, Saddam's, modeled on Saddam's hands holding the, holding the um, uh, Saracenic swords across there. Uh, and we were largely based around here where the old embassy was and the growing, uh, and the growing um, Ministry of Defense there. But, but still very, I used to fly in daily from, from the other part of town, really down this line. This used to be a, a place, when I was doing my Arabic course, we used to, there was always great stories about how the lovely Basma and I would be going to have Maz Goof in Abu Nawaz Street, which was here, but it, I don't think I'd have gone there with Basma to Abu Nawaz Street when I arrived there in 2006. That is the, the embassy that was, this, this is where the American, uh, Americans operated out of, uh, and George Casey, who was commanding the, uh, commanding the overall coalition operation at that. Uh, and I would daily go in there to do the reconstruction. That again, the well-known iconic figures. Here, buried across here, are helmets from the Iraq-Iranian war. And there's big, you won't, you won't be able to see, there's big, baskets there, again, full of Iranian helmets from, from that war. View down the Tigris, when we're coming in from the airport where I was based in the headquarters, um, I'd come in, as I say, to deal either with, as the interface with the Iraqi army, uh, or the re I led the reconstruction effort in Baghdad at that time. Very difficult when you didn't have full security to get real traction and fly down, fly down the Tigris River into the international zone. I think Baghdad, as it is, I would say, always looked, it's made out of mud. There's very little, very little stain there. Actually, the Tigris, I always remember, we, the British have a sort of, have a, we, we've got a rather encouraging sort of place in the pantheon of villains in that part of the world. And somebody said, we have a saying in Baghdad, Simon, when two fish fight in the Tigris, the English are behind it. <laughs> Sadder city. And we used to occasionally, very at this stage, there was a real... The Jaysh al-Mahdi were really very, very resurgent. Our capacity to actually control security in Baghdad when the Sunni militia, supported by al-Qaeda, were launching a series of spectacular suicide bombs, vehicle-borne IEDs, etc. You can imagine, it's a, it's a city of seven and a half million people, how difficult it is to protect that type of population or that type of scene 
when somebody is simply prepared to drive a car bomb into it. Not enough soldiers until we began to leverage uh, the Iraqi capability. Just again to rattle through this, that, that was the green zone area there. The main headquarters for the Corps where I was working with Peter Corelli was actually out of the airport. And in the early days, this, what was called Route Irish, was always described as the most dangerous four kilometers in the world. They have just taken down all the barricades along that. But we used to drive at night, single car. You'd have one car behind you with its headlights on. You'd drive in. No, the car in front, headlights on. The car behind, cars behind, no headlights on to give the impression you were just a single vehicle, not a convoy, therefore not worth attacking. But we were... We were, we were banjoed a couple of times on that route. Uh, and this is the main airport, which again, clearly we're, we're hoping to reopen, absolutely critical to the economic health of uh, Baghdad. That was the Al 4 Palace, where the, where the core headquarters was. Just across that bridge there uh, was, the, uh, was the Iraqi Ground Force headquarters, and I was the mentor for, for bringing General Ali and his team up to speed. And thoroughly good fun they were too, dare I say, and a lot of very, very brave people. They were targeted mercilessly, both by the Shias, uh, the Jaysh al-Mahdi, who saw them as the compromisers, and certainly by the Sunni militia, who saw them as, as part of the, the development of Iraq, much to, their dis much, much to their disadvantage. That was the lake, an artificial lake. It's where Saddam used to um, meet his visitors when they, when they flew, into, uh, flew into Baghdad. These guys came up from Nazaria, funnily enough, down in the south. They were Nazarene boatmen, normally on the Euphrates, who came to remove all this weeds. That's me. Um, so it could be very pleasant in the morning if you weren't being shelled. Um, just occasionally you sort of duck back inside. But very, you know, it, it, it was that awful contrast of knowing that you were sort of quite well protected, flying over it into well protected bases, or going out with body armor, with helmets, etc., and finding yourself finding around you bloody carnage from militia killings or from, uh, or, or from uh, vehicle, vehicle borne IEDs. And I'll come back to the thing. I, I, I want to put this up. I'm going to put up a number of these slides, not because I need you to read the, um, ev every detail, but this, this I tell you, this, this is about halfway, halfway through my, my tour there. And this is, again, these, these just came up every day. I mean, the, feeding the American desire for statistics was a, a, a sight in itself. Yeah, you know, it really was. I mean, the Americans who worked very hard anyway were, were almost meeting themselves, getting out of bed as they went to bed uh, in order to keep, to keep this statistical stuff. Interesting sometimes. Didn't always tell you the trend on the ground. But I just want to draw your attention because I'll, I'll, I'll use a similar slide and just note the date. This was 06. This was almost the height. Al-Zakawi had bombed the Golden Mosque in March. And it had set off what people said, is there a civil war in Iraq? We said, yes, there, there bloody well could be. And I'll show you the, I'll, I'll show you the, the statistics of attacks and deaths, because it, it escalated horrendously from that. And we had the militias running riot in Baghdad. We used to find, I kid you not, dozens of bodies just lying in the streets each, each morning. If they'd been decapitated, that was normally Sunni jihadist death squads. If they'd been drilled with an electric power tool, that was normally a Shia death squad. Very unpleasant very, a very, very vicious, unpleasant war going on in the suburbs of Baghdad, to which we simply did not have the force levels to do. We could not, we, we simply did not have the capacity at that stage to protect the local population, and we didn't have enough, um, a, a didn't have enough capacity within the Iraqi army. But I just draw your attention to that. that. That was an average day, 126 attacks. And if you look over here, I know this one, 220 civilians killed that day. Another 290 injured. I remember it well. There were two enormous car bombs went off in, um, in, in Sada City. Sunnis in Baghdad did not dare go to any hospital because they were run by the Jaysh al-Mahdi Shia militia and you would not come out alive. And if they differ, we, we took on all the medical support for the, uh, for the Iraqi army because many of the Iraqi army were, were Sunnis signing up to support the new Iraq, badly let down by us in those early years. Um, again, I'll throw this up because there's December 06, and I'm leaping ahead a bit, but this will just give you density, density of attacks we were dealing with almost on, a, almost on a daily basis. Just to break it out, because you can, you can see it over here now, Shear area, that area there is Sada City. There's about a million people, a million and a half people living there. Very difficult for any, any a police force. It's like, like Palermo, whatever. But you can just see, I, I hope, about how there, there's going back to November ethno-sectarian deaths. These are simply civilians 
being killed by other, inverted commas, civilians, death squads, bombs, etc. Nothing to do with any military action that's going on. But you can just see how we began to, we began to track uh, a much better uh, future for Iraq. And it was about here that the surge kicked in. That's General Peter Corelli, who I worked for. He was the, he's now the Vice Chief of the Army in, in, in the United States. A really thinking American general. I'm, you know, it's very easy to stereotype the great, um, the great American army. Um, Italian-American, much beloved by the Iraqis. A real, really had his finger on the pulse. And it was a great pity he did not go back on, uh, uh, after Petraeus. I dealt with this man, General Riyadh, a lot. He now commands the Mosul operation. He is a Sunni. He is a man who made a conscious decision that he would, he would move from the Saddam forces uh, and come and join the coalition. Now a lieutenant general in Mosul, the last big, big punch up there. And General Adnan, when we were there, his son, he had one son kidnapped and killed, and he had another one kidnapped, um, and we, we, he got him back. We never asked how he did it, but quite clearly, I say we were, we, we were blamed. Very brave people, drove into work every day knowing they were being targeted. That happens to be the chief of the general staff, is he? Prime Minister Maliki, um, that's Ninos, who was my interpreter. Absolutely brilliant. He was paid bloody sight more than I was, frankly. Probably, deser Prime probably deserved it. Chicago, Chicago Christian Iraqi. What was brilliant about it, the best interpreters is they could interpret your body language as well. So they didn't just interpret the words. They, they, they were quick enough to work out what you mean is, and if you're using colloquialisms, they, they turned it into matter. And this, is, this was actually a discussion about Diala that I was having with them. Prime Minister Maliki at the time. I would try my Arabic out occasionally, and I'd find that he would take my Arabic, translate in his head back into English, then back into Arabic and speak Arabic as well. I'd say, no, I've just said that, actually. Oh, right. He'd say, yeah, I got it. Sorry about that. But really good, and a good interpreter. Ab absolutely, absolutely invaluable. We had a worry at that stage that Maliki was going to be too weak. Very interesting. Again, it's concepts of leadership out there that will not necessarily match Western models of concepts of leadership. He's very cleverly maneuvered himself into, into quite a, a powerful position, given, his, um, given, given where he's come from. But a, he inherited a very, very difficult situation. This is reconstruction. General Abdulaziz, who ran the area around Kirkuk and the Beji oil fields, masses of corruption there. And here we are really uh, discussing with the, uh, the, the Iraqi um, oil ministry how we're going to get the pipelines open uh, through uh, Baghdad, uh, down to Baghdad. We had appalling problems getting electricity into Baghdad. Every day we were down at about five hours. And again, quite rightly, the Iraqis would say, you can put a man on the moon. You know, why can't you get electricity into us? Well, there's no doubt about it. Demand had risen, but the insurgency in its various guises was actively tackling, uh, tackling the uh, power supplies. Just point out, 20, 22 May, 148 back in November, 122. Again, you can just see, still, still high. Coming into 2007-8, Dave Petraeus took over. David Petraeus had been in Iraq. If any of you have read Fiasco, he's the sort of hero of Tom Ricks's book. He wrote the counterinsurgency strategy. They went right back to basics and said, this is, this is absolutely Clausewitz. It's war among the people. We have got to understand what the political end state we want in Iraq. Stable, representative government. We've got to engage with the Iraqis. We've got to form a coalition with the Iraqis. This cannot be imposed by the coalition. He wrote the doctrine, he turned the American training around, and he arrived in Baghdad to execute it, along with 30,000 US troops. The great thing to understand about the surge, which was looked on, as I say, narrowly as American troops coming in, was the surge had to be supported by a surge in reconciliation, a surge in economic development, a surge in reconstruction, a surge in capacity for the Iraqi security forces to take responsibility. That is what the surge was, much, much bigger. And it's that that began, that strategy that began to, began to dig us out of, out of trouble. You can see here, down to about 42, that's by October. Later in October, down to about 20. It's rested there. Last month, October, was the first month we didn't have an American soldier killed in a month. When I was there, we were losing 100, 100 a month, and we were having, as I, said, as I showed you, <coughs> civilian casualties way, way up. In the, in, the, in, the, in the hundreds every month, uh, you know, a shocking situation to be in. And you can see here the, the attacks, really, really low level. Mostly, and this is, this is very recent, one or two still in Baghdad. Al-Qaeda has not lost the capacity to generate spectaculars. And I say with a population of, 
of 7.5 million, very, very difficult to harden the, harden, the, uh, harden the civil population. We took a lot of the issues that we had had in Belfast in terms of peace walls and actually surrounded with masses of checkpoints, vehicle checkpoints. We put barriers all around the various Sunni and Shia areas. It's not ideal, but at least you get a handle on the violence. You can control it. And then we use special forces operations and a very quick action reaction cycle to unravel the, the bomb makers uh, and, and, and their networks. And hence, up here is where they began to go. In the meantime, we had the whole Sons of Iraq, Iraqi awakening, because the jihadists had so totally overplayed their hand. Now, if we thought we had failed to identify how to work with the grain of the country, largely, I hasten to add, I think, out of misunderstanding or crassness or just lack of education, maybe. The jihadists actively, actively acted against the tribal elements here in, um, in the Euphrates Valley. And the level of atrocities they carried out against anybody who attempted to compromise, join the security forces, cooperate with the security forces, was horrendous, and I will not go into detail. But as we, the coalition, and by that I, I do wish to talk about those elements of Iraqi society that wish a better future for themselves and the coalition enablers and the money, began to, began to get our strategy right, the jihadist strategy, characterized by our, actually we'd killed uh, al Zakari then, but al Masri began to backfire on them as it was quite clear that that philosophy, A, had nothing to do with the interests of the Iraqi at the heart of it and was actually almost as alien to the Iraqi uh, philosophy as, as, as our own had been at the start. I'll just throw these up. I don't want to over labor these, conscious of time. But that, again, is ju just to show you from here the Samara bombing. We'd, we'd bumbled along here. This is just various types. I think, but you can just see how, how it began to ramp up enormously uh, out until the end of, uh, uh, until actually well into 2007. The surge began about that time. But you, know, you can take it or leave it in terms of statistics. That's how quickly, once we began to use the additional American troops and we began to raise the capacity of the Iraqi army and expand it, how quickly we began to get a handle for everybody's benefit on the, on the situation. Uh, and that just takes it further forward. There's 07. Daily attack average. Every day, assassinations, killings, bombings, etc. And that's where we're beginning to head to. It's not perfect by any means, but it's considerably better. Just a few uh, pictures, just to illustrate it. One side of the surge, more, more American troops. Give one, classic one, you know, no eye contact. I think you, you know, many of you will have watched those television images in 2010 and said, here are people being shouted at in their own country by somebody who hasn't even got the good, good nature to take their sunglasses off and, and make, you know, thing. And all of us, of course, dressed up in our body armor and our helmets, carrying guns, looking frightening and in some ways looking frightened. And so, you know, you're, you're sending all the wrong messages sometimes in an Arabic society. Again, I'll just, I'll just throw these up as they're just representative of American operations. And again, they just became, the, the, the sooner we could get the Iraqi army into the fight, the more we began to do joint, the more we began to step back. So it was the Iraqi army interfacing with the tribes. Quite right too. An Iraqi face, an Arabic voice, talking, talking to the locals. Absolutely what should have been done from the start. Strategy completely wrong. We had a big worry about whether the Shia army would become sectarian become infiltrated by the Jaysh al-Mahdi and begin to act against the Sunnis. As part of the, the, the um, revolt against uh, al-Qaeda in the Euphrates Valley, uh, we found that most of the army in two and seven divisions were Shias, and if properly supported by Americans in this case, we've done the same in Basra, um, we found out they were remarkably effective and were quite prepared to act in a completely neutral Iraqi manner gave enormous confidence to people because, of course, again, the jihadists were playing on that Sunni fear that the, uh, the Shia were going to dominate them, commit genocide, etc. Americans, closer, trying to, get, trying to get business, trying to get the markets open, trying to get, uh, get some degree of normalcy back to it, trying to get life boring again. And having spent quite a lot of time in Northern Ireland, boring is what you want in a, a counterinsurgency. Not quite sure what the hell we're looking at there, to be honest with you. Uh, again, <laughs> that's not me, but it does show at least a bit of effort 
We began under a counterinsurgency. The Americans put a hell of a lot of work into training up linguists. Terribly important. And we're doing the same. A bit late, you might say, and you could well be right, but allied to everything else, it began to have an effort, and it showed the right, you know, it, it just sent a strong message. This absolutely critical, the build-up of the Iraqi army. We had dismantled it, much to everybody's loss in 2004. We didn't even pay it. We just said, you've got no route, you're a bunch of, you're a bunch of losers, you're probably traitors, uh, go home. You know, extended family, shame-based culture, etc. sent a horrible message. You, you sent people home, you knew how to use weapons, you didn't guard the ammunition sites, whoa, lo and behold. But the build-up, absolutely critical, and we just did not get our hands on this at all. Absolutely critical. Terrific bunch of people, the Iraqis really are, and they've stepped up from all parts, Kurd, Arab, Sunni, Shia, to join, to join the Iraqi army. That's myself again, with the Americans, and with uh, General Adnan. And we were setting up as part of the surge to bring more Iraqi troops into the capital. A big issue for them, bringing the Iraqi troops into the capital, they were quite regionally based. They didn't really want to move. We were bringing actually quite a Kurdish element down to enter a Shia Sunni fight in Baghdad. Again, General, Taliban, uh, General Talab uh, from the 7th Division. Iraqi police, quite happy to be drawn on that in, in question time. Very different. We know this, if you're a policeman, you live among the community, you're much more open to either intimidation or bribery. It's just a fact of life. Um, so the Iraqi army, a bit like in Afghanistan, the, the uh, Afghan, um, uh, Afghan army, has grown incapably much quicker uh, than, the, than, than the, um, the Iraqi police. And it's no disrespect to them. Again, a lot of them very, very, um, uh, very patriotic Iraqis, but who have do find themselves living among the community under enormous pressure uh, from their own sectarian groups. The handover, more and more Iraqis, not just leading, but actually doing their own planning, being put forward as operations, and developing a real sense, as I say, Shias, Sunnis alongside each other, rejecting foreign fighters coming in with no regard for Iraq's future, uh, and, and operating in a, in a particularly good manner. Well supported by the coalition, they need to be. They haven't got medical support, they're logistically poor on that side. But taking on very brave operations. Again, General Talib. A uh, lot of reconstruction, absolutely critical for trying to get employment, to give people. These are, these are the people, again, we used to arrest, in 2003 4 we just used to arrest anybody of military age. Humanitarian age, opening new sewage works, water, etc. Health education, propaganda. <laughs> I'm just going to now finish just a, few, just a couple of quick slides to say where, where I believe we are, we are now. This is important. We've got a government that's up and running. It's finding its way. It's got, it's got problems. It's got divisions. But it is acting as a government. Absolutely critical. We're getting more international diplomatic support. We are trying to persuade clearly Sunni governments around the region that a Shia dominated government in Iraq is not inimicable to their interests. I believe their Arab identity will prove to be stronger than their Shia identity when, they, when it comes to, um, comes to dealing with Iran. Growing popular support, interesting this, this is what you need, increased confidence, <coughs> demonstrating sovereignty, that's going to make it difficult for us. Al-Qaeda on the decline, They've had a strategic decline. That's when I was really there. Covert terrorism, surviving. They've largely, when you read jihadist whatever networks, they've largely admitted they're, they're, they, they are losing there. Moving to Afghanistan. A hell of an attrition rate, either killed or captured in the hierarchy. Jaysh al-Mahdi, when you're Shia militia fighting the coalition, you can look like a nationalist. If you're Jaysh al-Mahdi fighting the Iraqi army, fundamentally Shia, you look like a surrogate for the Persians. And as General Mohan said to me the other day, and he is a Shia general, believe me, Simon, there is a wall of fire between ourselves and the Persians. And could move towards the sort of Hezbollah mode, we don't want the, on, the, on the military side Hezbollah, support, social work, etc. And we'll see how much that is. We can't, we can't deny there will always be Iranian influence within the Shia population, fact of life. But the government needs to establish government, a government to government arrangements. Sunni insurgency on the wane, we've got to make sure, Ramadi, there was a 5,000-person fun run there, if any run can be called fun in Ramadi, but I say 
two years ago, you, you wouldn't have stepped out of the, out without assuming you'd be shot. Got to remain engaged with them. They've got to believe that, they, that the, a Shia government can, can reconcile with them. Sons of Iraq, we've begun to transition the Sons of Iraq from payment by the coalition to payment by the government. There are concerns by a Shia government of arming Sunnis again. The paranoia of a return of Saddam should not, should not be under, underestimated. Arab neighbors, absolutely critical for supporting um, Iraq. Trade, diplomatic support, clamping down on the borders, etc. And you know that whole business with the, with the American strike in Syria. Makes for very complex international relations, but Iraq has got to persuade its neighbors that it deals with them as a sovereign nation increasingly, not one occupied by the coalition. Developing security forces I've talked about, gaps, Undoubtedly, and we've got to be careful that Maliki doesn't believe he's got a more potent instrument in his hand than he actually has. Tension in the north, Kurds, Arabs, Kirkuk, oil, etc. Uh, we've got to watch that. It will be exploited. AQI have been very clever at exploiting these. Current situation then, in transition, certainly potential for reversal. Dave Petraeus, I think we've got to be utterly realistic about this. That's important. That's important. The big mo, the momentum, who do you feel is going to be win? How do you get off the fence? Who do you put your, who do you, who, who do you back? Yes, uh, yes, important, really important for the average Iraqi. And I'll just finish with some concerns. The key leaders are clearly victims of their own, uh, their own um, past, their own political experience. Maliki can't really have a go at the Americans, but doesn't really like the British. We have got to get these elections well run in January. There will be a real litmus test how that works out. The security operation will be run by the Iraqis. We will be absolutely and quite rightly simply there to give, give support to them if they need it. We've got to manage this properly. That has the potential to be difficult, particularly if the Sunnis decide to be vindictive, uh, so the Shia decide to be vindictive. This is proving to be a very, very potent brand name. Um, it's very much on the back foot. Take the pedal off, they could, there could be resurgence. Kurdish intransigence, they've got to have pressure on them to again feel they're part of Iraq. They've got a potential to be very rich themselves, but actually they're under all pressures as we all know around. And we hope that the ceasefire with the Sadrists continues to hold as it does at the moment. They've got everything to gain. We need to get economic reform in there so that we can soak up that unemployment among that very youthful population, give it a, give it a focus and stop it being drawn away as we had, dare I say, in Northern Ireland, I'm not trying to make too many close analogies, where the glamour of the gun is more important than actually a contribution to uh, the society you live in. Thank you very much. Can I ask Dr. Elizabeth Kendall, who is the director of the Centre for Advanced Studies of the Arab World, to give a vote of thanks? Tasked with this... Uh, <laughs> enormous burden of trying to do justice to the general in, in a short vote of thanks. I think just the range of the questions showed how fascinating the topic was. I know that I myself was very impressed by how enlightening it was. It was actually quite a surprise to learn that someone at the top of our military actually does think about the complexities of the development of... <laughs> That's a barbed compliment. The complexities of the formation of the nation state in the Middle East, uh, not to mention bothering to inform himself about the Arabic language, and also thinking about the broader definitions of jihad itself. So not only was it very enlightening, it was also a great relief to, to listen to. I should also add that it's quite rare that I'm so riveted by staring at charts of statistics and graphs, not to mention somebody else's uh, travel holiday photo collection, uh, but, I, but I was, so thank you very much. Before I give the final thanks, I'd also like to just extend my thanks to the team at Castle for organising this, in particular to Sophie Lowry, the master coordinator, but also to Rona Cullen and Kim Dixon and our stewards. I'd like to thank the RSE, uh, in particular Graham Herbert, for allowing us to use these beautiful premises and uh, for basically helping us with the organization and making sure everything went smoothly.
And then finally to General Simon, who didn't have to come and talk to us tonight. I think it was quite brave of him to face a Scottish audience, a student audience, a well-informed audience on Middle East policy. Um, I'm not sure how many people would have also taken questions after a talk such as yours. So thank you for that. Thank you also for your honesty in trying to point out some of the areas in which perhaps the coalition went wrong. And also for opening this to the general public and allowing us to record it. I'd now like to thank you all for turning up and invite you warmly to a reception which we're going to have upstairs. So please join me in thanking Simon. <laughs> Is it right? Yeah. That, that went very well. Once you got into your stride, it, it, it carries away. I was, 